Today we're in New York with a very, very special guest indeed. He's a true legend of modern watchmaking, the protege of the late great Dr. George Daniels, and a watch collector in his own right. His name is Roger Smith, and today we're talking watches. Roger, thank you so much for joining us today. Just fantastic to have you on Talking Watches. Just to jump right into it, one of the most interesting pieces that we have here is a very, very, very early coaxial pocket watch movement. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, that'd be great. Certainly, so this, this pocket watch movement was part of a collaboration which was struck up between George and Patek Philippe back in the early 1980s. At the time, George was obviously very keen to get his escapement industrialized. So he uh, very quickly started to uh, make moves and inroads into the Swiss watch industry. And uh, one of the first companies, I think it was the first company, was Patek Philippe. This was in around uh, 1980. And um, discussions took place. They were interested in looking at the possibilities of developing the Patek Philippe watch to house the coaxial escapement. And uh, this is a result, this pocket watch movement. So just to, just to sort of refresh all of our memories, the, the basic argument for the coaxial escapement is it's a superiority to the lever escapement. Yeah, and basically it's the way the power is delivered. So in the um, lever escapement, you have the power delivered by a sliding action. So basically a tooth hits a jewel, and then as this tooth slides down this jewel, it imparts energy through to the balance wheel. And in the lever, sorry, in the coaxial escapement, you simply have a tooth that hits a jewel and pushes it away. And it's that difference, the sliding against a pushing action. The sliding action of the lever always requires lubrication for it to work, whereas the pushing action in the coaxial doesn't. And before, before this movement was uh, created at Patek Philippe, uh, how long had Dr. Daniels been working on this uh, concept? So he started, I mean, he started on this quest to improve the mechanical timekeeper in the late 1960s, about 68, 69. He produced his first piece mm -hmm. in 69. So you could see early on that George had ideas and he was already tinkering around with the escapement. Mm -hmm. And that development went on then, from the detent through to some early coaxial type systems. And then it resulted in the coaxial in, I think, about 75. He was obviously motivated by the intellectual challenge, the technical challenge yeah. of doing something that no one had ever successfully done before because there had been previous attempts to combine mm. these two escapements. Mm. But he was also emotionally motivated, from what I've heard from you. Yes. I mean, George's life had been involved in the mechanical timekeeping. And he was very annoyed and frustrated by the position of the Swiss watch industry, mm. which in the late 60s, 70s, was going through complete and utter turmoil. What was very frustrating for George was to see these quartz watches driven by these batteries. And he used to say with the battery that it's the sole purpose, dedicated purpose of every single battery to commit suicide as quickly as possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was right. And, um, he also, he also yeah. used the word electricians for watchmakers that were involved in electric, uh, electronic watchmaking. Yes. And he, very pejoratively. Yes, yes. Well, that's politely. He called them the, these damned electricians. Damned electricians. Damned electricians who are sort of basically pulling his world to bits. He wanted to put a watch on his wrist or in his pocket, which he knew would tick away for 10, 15, 20 years without attention. Mm -hmm. And he felt he could achieve that. And he did achieve that. And so how did the work progress at Paddock? How was the, I mean, they obviously did not decide ultimately to adopt the coaxial escapement. So they sort of felt that really the coaxial wasn't suitable for their needs. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned that in, in any event, pocket watches is not their future. Mm. Wrist watches is the future. So the one thing you didn't do with George was challenge him. So he immediately got into watches and he started to um, redesign the escapement to fit into a wristwatch and he achieved it. And he wore that wristwatch for 10 years, I think. He never ever said it lost time or anything, you know, he's a perfect runner. Um, but it wasn't enough to convince Patek that this was a way forward. And we have uh, a couple of wristwatches, which are early wristwatch prototypes for a, uh, the coaxial escapement. That's right. So Amiga became interested in the coaxial. And George started working with Amiga in 19, I think it was about 94. This was an early sort of prototype. So the movements are 2892, so traditionally a lever escapement and they use that movement as the base caliber for fitting the coaxial. These two pieces were basically dummy watches that the R&D team were wearing 
for testing and so on. And George was sent a few and we wore these two pieces in the workshop for a couple of years just to test and you know, see how they performed. And even after the first limited editions came out in 1999, the escapement did continue to uh, have some teething issues. Yes, yes. I noticed that early on, actually, in the process. I went to work with George to help build the Millennium series of wristwatches. And we were building these first few pieces. And we always used to set the escapement into the mechanism and then feed the escapement through. So basically just rolling the balance back and forth, and watching every single tooth. And um, of the eight teeth, on the escape wheel, three of them missed the jewel. So um, I remember telling George this, George immediately examined the piece and then got on the phone to Amiga in Switzerland and told them what we'd noticed. It's interesting actually that this issue has always been an issue with the coaxial. And um, this piece here, if you were to feed the escape through the teeth, will miss well, that's the jewel. And then when I developed the coaxial for my series two, three teeth missed the jewel. Oh, that's fascinating. Was it fundamentally a precision issue? Uh, it's a precision, precision issue, issue, yeah. I mean, the lever escapement, for its faults, it's incredibly tolerant. The coaxial isn't. But when the coaxial is right, it's far superior. One of the things that uh, is uh, sort of notably absent from this group of watches is one of your own, speaking yes. of um, you know more current evolution of the coaxial yes. escapement. And uh, the, I think the issue, as you've expressed it, you make a very small number and they, they sort of have to go away from home and start working for a living pretty early on. Yeah, lives. yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's, we're making 10 a year. We have a really good order book. I've never been able to take a 10th of the year out to make a watch for myself, really. We've just got to try and make the watches for the clients. And yeah. I don't mind that, you know, I mean, my focus has always been the watches. I get to test each watch before it's delivered. And I'm always looking for um, improvements. You know, I'm very sort of technically minded and all these watches here, they're all here because of their mechanics. This was George's Mark 11 Jaeger. Stainless steel case is made in 1948. The Mark 11s sort of came about, they were obviously built during the war and they were built for precision. Very nice movement inside, super accurate. It has an iron back cover, which protects the mechanism from magnetism. So these, you know, these were real state of the art pieces when they were made and you know, the watch still keeps excellent time and it's a, a brilliant mechanical watch. Well, in terms of precision timekeeping, we have something else here that you brought. And I haven't seen one of these in person in a long, long time. Yes. And, uh, I'm just, just tickled pink to see it here today. <laughs> this piece is um, an Amiga marine chronometer. And uh, this piece was made in 1976. This was the Swiss watch industry in turmoil. You know, they've been throwing out all their mechanical watchmaking equipment, knowledge and so on and they were desperate to reinvent themselves. The quartz market was booming and they were seriously under threat. So basically a group of makers got together. They all piled huge sums of money into this program to develop a super accurate quartz watch. And this is a result. At the time, this watch was the world's most accurate quartz watch. Mm -hmm. it has an accuracy of uh, 12 seconds per year, but the battery only lasts for 10 months. <laughs> well, a, a part of the issue is the accuracy was uh, achieved with a very high frequency oscillator, correct? That's right. So the oscillator vibrates. I mean, it's just staggering. It, it's just slightly short of two and a half million times per second. As opposed to a standard quartz oscillator, which is about 32,000? Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a staggering Incredible. achievement. I mean, this, this was super technology. This was groundbreaking technology at the time. And uh, in, the, in the group of watches that you've brought that are, uh, that are yours personally, we have another one that I think people will be quite interested to see, mm. which is this, uh, this beautiful Speedmaster. Yes, yes. So this is an Ed White. Again, the main interest for me with this watch is a mechanism. And the Caliber 321 is a world-class chronograph movement. And just the way it's been designed, you can tell that the people who designed that movement were watchmakers. They really understood what they were doing. And they designed a bulletproof mechanism so this watch was made in 65 and still goes strong today. No wear in the mechanism. It's in perfect condition, you know, a service and it's back to life again. And you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So very few watch collectors nowadays are sort of aware of what it is that makes one movement qualitatively better than another. And yeah. you know, you, do, you read praise of the Caliber 321, but what aspects of it do you think um, make it such an elevated movement? Well, I mean, years ago, I used to do trade repairs when I was funding my watchmaking. 
And the moment, you know, one of the Amigas from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s came in the bag, you know, you knew that that was going to be an easy morning for you because you knew that you decase the watch, take the dial hands off, strip down the mechanism, clean it, and the mechanisms would go back together again with such ease. You never had hassle. And the reason for that is just because the mechanisms are so well designed. And of course, your everyday watch, which uh, I think many viewers are going to be quite pleased to see. <laughs> my wife bought me this for my 40th. It was actually a second-hand piece when I got it. I think it's about 13 years old now, 14 years old now. I always liked Rolex. The very first watch that I ever bought was a Rolex. It's a manual wind oyster date. And I bought that when I was, I think, about 17, which was quite a young age to own a Rolex. But I worked in a jeweler's shop in Manchester all summer, every single weekend for about nine months. And every single penny I earned, I saved up to buy this watch. But the problem was, I was so terrified about wearing it, I never wore it. I used to wear it very occasionally, probably on about two or three occasions. And then when I got into the watchmaking side, when I was trying to make my very first watch, I ran out of money and had to sell the watch. Oh. So this watch sort of, in, you know, really replaces that. Yeah, it takes a little bit of the salt out of exactly. the wound. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, with, with Rolex, the, you know, the impression that you get when you look at the exterior of a Rolex is of a very high precision in manufacturing, but with, uh, with, without anything, you know, really extraneous. And that's, I think, the thing that Rolex is probably most known for on the outside. But again, do you feel that Rolex deserves the respect that uh, some of us have for it in terms of the quality of manufacturing of the, of the engine itself? Yeah, without a doubt. What I see as an asset is that they have never really changed their movements. They've upgraded them. Mm -hmm. I think, you'll know probably no more than me, that the, the mechanism in this is probably about 30 odd years old. Mm -hmm. And why change a good thing? Why reinvent it? Yeah. You know, people used to say to me with the Series 2, oh, when are you going to stop it? When are you going to make a new movement? And I always used to say, and still say to this day, well, I designed what I consider to be a good movement. And they've got a great watch, a great product, and I wear this watch every day. If I'm going for dinner, wear it at work, wear it in the garden, fixing the car. You know, it's a great all-rounder. Roger, tell us a little bit about what you're working on uh, currently. What's going on in the workshop? Well, just to go back a couple of years, in 2015, I launched a new range of watches, all built around a Mark II movement that I've designed. The Mark II movement came about as a result of development of the coaxial escapement. Back in 2010, I came up with the idea for a single wheel coaxial escapement, which improves the accuracy. Since then, I refined the escapement. I created a lightweight version. And now with this Mark II, I reduced the scale of the escapement. And by reducing the scale, it's improved the performance of the watch so, hugely. So when, when uh, uh, the name coaxial escapement comes from the fact that there are two escape wheels mounted coaxially, one on top of the other. That's right. And uh, the newer version that you're working with, when you say single escape wheel, it's still two levels, but it's made as one piece. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that just guarantees perfect concentricity between these two sets of teeth to their pivot point. And then also the correct angular orientation, which is very important in this escape. And you're not missing, uh, you're not missing three teeth anymore. I'm not. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. yeah.